All right, hi everybody. Welcome back, Attorney Steve Vondran. Welcome to another exciting podcast. And for my TikTokers watching simultaneously, we are talking today about Ripple, SEC, Motion for Summary Judgment. This is what I call the crypto case of the decade. And so I decided to put some time again, time into this. And the other day, a couple days ago, I did the SEC motion for summary judgment. Today, I am doing the other side, Ripple. I told you I would do both sides and then you can decide, um, you know, which side of the fence that you're on. So without further ado, let's talk about it, okay? So we, if you have any, uh, if you have any uh, friends that are into crypto, XRP, the XRP army as they call them, Ripple, RippleNet, whatever you guys want to talk about it, crypto, let them know now. So we are talking about SEC versus Ripple, Ripple Labs Inc., Bradley Garlinghouse, and Christian Larson, uh, CEOs of uh, Ripple. All right, so... If, you, if you're missing uh, my first video and you want to see what was the SEC version, what was SEC's motion for summary judgment about, go to attorneystevevideos.com, attorneystevevideos.com. I told you I would do both sides, let you decide, and uh, it's up there at attorneystevevideos.com. But thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Um, send this feed to any of your friends that are really into crypto because it's probably things that you haven't heard. There are so many... Um, things that uh, facts and factors and things that most people don't really know and they a lot of people don't know the difference between XRP and Ripple and that's kind of why I think that we're here in this lawsuit but let's go ahead without further ado let's start talking about the SEC versus Ripple and this is the motion for summary judgment by Ripple ads now so you know XRP has already filed excuse me the SEC filed a complaint against Ripple Labs, alleging that Ripple was selling XRP as an investment contract. And since it's a so-called investment contract under the Howey test, you'll hear me talk about Howey, it needs to be registered as a security. Ripple, on the other hand, says, no, there's no investment contract. We didn't sign any contracts with anybody. So without further ado, let's go into it a little bit further. This is Defendant's Memorandum of Law in support of their motion for summary judgment. And folks, this case is being heard in the United States District Court, Southern District of New York. New York, okay. So um, let's go into it. Uh, now I'm gonna tell you in advance, this is not a short piece of work. This is about 90, 91 pages. And I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna read most of it. I don't know if I'll read the whole thing because you know, frankly, that's. That's a long, uh, long piece of work here, but we're going to get into it. Um, the SEC brief talked a lot about marketing it as an investment contract. And let's see what Ripple has to say in response to those allegations. And again, some are calling this the crypto case of the decade because we might actually have some um, regulation coming out of this. And my office gets a lot of calls from people that have been scammed this and that, lost money, you know, all kinds of things. And so a lot of people are talking, maybe this will be the case that really lays the groundwork for regulation and future regulation and how crypto assets and digital assets and tokens and things, how they will be handled. So let's get into it here. Thanks for the letting me do that long introduction. Appreciate it. So let's go into it. Introduction. Now, again, this is from Ripple Labs point of view. If you're saying, well, what was the other, what did the SEC say? That's what I really want to know. Go to my, my YouTube channel, attorneystevevideos.com, attorneystevevideos.com. Got a couple hundred hits on that already if you want to check that out. All right, let's go. Defendant Ripple Labs, Ripple. And by the way, I won't do a lot of quotes. I will show you a few, but I'm not showing you all of them just so you know. <clears throat> Give me a second. Let me warm up here. All right. Defendant Ripple Labs, Inc., Ripple, is a privately held financial technology company employing more than 700 people in 15 offices worldwide. Defendant Christian Larson is its current executive chairman. 
defendant Bradley Garlinghouse is its current chief executive officer. That's what we call CEO. For the past decade, Ripple has worked with its customers, financial institutions, payment providers, and corporations to make cross-border payments, such as remittances. Faster, cheaper, and more transparent. Ripple's customers have transferred more than 10 billion in payments to date via Ripple products that use the XRP ledger and XRP. The XRP ledger launched in 2012 is a distributed ledger enabled by open source software technology that can securely record transactions at lightning fast speeds. The XRP ledger's inherent properties and ability to use XRP as a bridge currency make it an ideal vehicle for near instantaneous cross-border payments. XRP is a virtual currency, the native currency of XRP ledger. A fixed supply of 100 billion XRP was generated by XRP's ledger code in 2012. Ripple's founders gave 80% of that to Ripple. Let me repeat. Ripple's founders gave 80% of that XRP to Ripple. Over the years, Ripple has sold some of the XRP it received. It, it has also donated and given away XRP and exchanged XRP for services and product development. The Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC, claims that any time XRP left Ripple's possession or the possession of the individual defendants from 2013 to 2020 as a sale, as a giveaway, as a charitable donation, or as consideration for vendor services, it did so as part of an unlawful offering of registered securities. Indeed, the SEC alleges that all XRP, even the 20 billion XRP that Ripple never owned, is a security issued by Ripple. Specifically, that all XRP was an investment contract with Ripple and therefore a security under the federal securities laws. As a matter of law, the SEC cannot prevail on that claim, nor can it lawfully extend its regulatory reach to offers to sell or sales of XRP that occurred on foreign cryptocurrency exchanges, which are governed by the laws of foreign countries and outside the territorial scope of the U.S. securities laws. Here comes the Howey test. The Supreme Court explained more than 75 years ago in SEC versus W.J. Howey Co. that the meaning of the statutory, statutory term investment contract was crystallized by a series of state cases interpreting state blue law skies. Every single blue sky case finding an investment contract had in every Supreme Court and Second Circuit case post-1933, including, including Howey itself, had, had also had three essential ingredients. First, the investment contract in every case involved a contract between a promoter and an investor that established the investor's rights as to an investment. Second, that contract imposed post-sale obligations on the promoter to take specific actions for the investor's benefit. Third, that contract granted the investor a right to share in profits from the promoter's efforts to generate a return on the use of investor funds. In the words of the well-known Howey test, these three essential ingredients articulate what it means to make an investment of money in a common enterprise with profits to come solely from the efforts of others. Now there's your Howey test, let's read it again. An investment of money 
think about this when you're investing into XRP, let's say. Was there an investment of money in a common enterprise with profits to come solely from the efforts of others? Think about that. The undisputed facts show that these essential ingredients of an investment contract are missing here. Many of the defendant's sales, donations, giveaways, and purchases using XRP during the rele relevant period created no contractual relationship at all between defendants and the XRP recipients. Where contracts with Ripple existed, those contracts defined no investment-related rights, imposed no post-transaction obligations on Ripple to take actions for XRP recipients' benefit, and gave no rights to those XRP recipients to demand and receive any profits from Ripple or anyone else. Unlike holding Ripple's equity, such as the stock Ripple sold in multiple funding rounds, Holding XRP gives the recipient no stake in any business enterprise and certainly no stake in Ripple. Let's read that again. Unlike holding Ripple's equity, such as the stock Ripple sold in multiple funding rounds, holding XRP gives the recipient no stake in any business enterprise and certainly no stake in Ripple. The SEC does not contend that those ingredients are present. Instead, its theory boils down to an impermissibly open-ended assertion of jurisdiction over any transfer of an asset for consideration or not that the SEC thinks may benefit from the registration and disclosure requirements of the securities laws. According to the SEC, there can be an investment contract without any contract, without any rights granted to the purchaser, and without any obligations on the issuer. That is not and should not be the law, because without these essential features, there is nothing to which the Howey test can sensibly be applied. The SEC's untethered position would convert the sales of all types of ordinary assets, diamonds, gold, soybeans, cars, and even works of art into sales of securities. Congress has given the agency no such authority. No pre-Howey Blue Sky case ever found an investment contract in such circumstances. Howey did not. No later Supreme Court case has, and no Second Circuit case has. This court should not either. Because XRP lacks the, the essential ingredients of an investment contract, the SEC also cannot show that purchasers of XRP satisfy the traditional Howey elements. There was no exchange of money for a significant portion of the XRP distributed by Ripple. And where money was ex exchanged, it was not an investment of money under Howey. There is no common enterprise in which those who purchase XRP invest. The SEC admits that Ripple itself is not such an enterprise, but then argues, contrary to binding Second Circuit precedent, that Ripple's efforts have created an amorphous enterprise comprised of countless third parties that the SEC calls the XRP ecosystem. Finally, there is no evidence from which a reasonable finder of fact could conclude that purchasers of XRP reasonably expected profits from defendants' efforts as opposed to market forces affecting cryptocurrencies generally. Let me read that one more time. Finally, there is no evidence from which a reasonable finder of fact could conclude that purchasers of XRP reasonably expected profits from defendants' efforts as opposed to market forces affecting cryptocurrencies generally. XRP does not have the character in commerce of a security. Unsurprisingly, therefore, it is regulated as a virtual currency by the U.S. Department of Treasury's Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN. 
as a commodity by the Com Com Commodity Futures Trading Commission, CFTC, as property under federal tax law, as an intangible asset under generally accepted accounting principles, but a security by none of those authorities. In straining to argue otherwise, the SEC is engaged in a regulatory land grab that far exceeds the boundaries Congress set on its authority. The SEC is not following the law. It is seeking to remake it. Factual background, Ripple's use of open source blockchain technology to modernize cross-border payments. The creation of the XRP ledger and XRP. The first blockchain ledger, Bitcoin, if you got that, congratulations, launched in 2009. In 2011 and early 2012, three individuals developed the source code for an alternative blockchain now known as the XRP Ledger. These individuals intended to create a better blockchain than Bitcoin by increasing the speed of transactions, reducing their costs, and minimizing energy consumption. To achieve these results, the XRP Ledger uses a consensus protocol to verify transactions. These consensus mechanisms of the XRP ledger is much faster, more reliable, and less costly than Bitcoin's proof of work mechanism. Transactions on the Bitcoin blockchain ordinarily take about 10 minutes to settle, with settlement times varying un unpredictably. Transactions on the XRP ledger ordinarily settle in three to five seconds. Bitcoin transactions also have, in the past, cost up to $60 per transaction. Transactions on the XRP ledger typically cost a fraction of a penny. Transactions on the XRP ledger also require less than 0.002% of the computing power required by Bitcoin's proof of work mechanism. XRP is the native currency of the XRP ledger. Upon its launch in 2012, the XRP ledger's code automatically generated a fixed supply of 100 billion XRP. Christian Larson, Jed McCaleb, and Arthur Brittle, Ripple's founders, gave 80 billion XRP to a newly formed corporate entity now called Ripple, retaining 20 billion among themselves. Let's read that again. Christian Larson, Jed McCaleb, and Arthur Brittle, Ripple's founders, gave 80 billion XRP to a newly formed corporate entity now called Ripple, retaining 20 billion among themselves. No XRP was sold before the launch of the XRP ledger. And Ripple never owned the 20 billion XRP retained by the three Ripple founders. When those individuals have sold any of their 20 billion XRP since 2012, the sales proceeds have never been held by Ripple or commingled in Ripple's corporate accounts. Today, Ripple owns roughly 50.2 billion XRP compared to the 49.8 billion held by persons and institutions other than and mostly unknown to Ripple. The founding of Ripple. Ripple was founded in 2012 after the core code for the XRP ledger was completed. It has raised investment capital through multiple funding rounds in which it sold stock, not XRP, to investors. Since its early days, Ripple's mission has been to realize an internet of value using technology to enable value to move as seamlessly as information does today over the internet. Some, but not all, of Ripple's products and services rely on the XRP ledger and XRP. One area Ripple targets is cross-border payments 
a roughly $20 trillion market that still depends on mid 20th century payment technologies. Traditional payment rails are slow, costly, and opaque. Fees for cross-border remittances can sometimes approach 10% of the payment amount, and payments can take multiple days to reach recipients, particularly in parts of the world that do not have well-developed technological infrastructures. Ripple seeks to modernize international payments by developing a global network for international currency transfers. RippleNet is a software product developed by Ripple that allows customers to clear and settle cross-border financial transactions on mutually agreed terms. RippleNet has been used by hundreds of financial institutions and payment providers across more than 55 countries and six continents. RippleNet customers can settle cross-border transactions using fiat currency or can opt to use a feature called on-demand liquidity, ODL, which uses XRP. ODL leverages the inherent properties of XRP, fast and slow uh, fast settlement and low transaction costs to allow cross-border transactions to settle in nearly real time rather than in days as traditional means require. ODL also enables transactions during various times when traditional banks are closed. Since its launch, ODL has experienced tremendous growth. To date, more than 10 billion in ODL payments have been made, meaning more than 10 billion in XRP has been used as a bridge currency to facilitate cross-border transactions using Ripple's products. Ripple's product successes have earned it accolades from publications such as Forbes, FinTech 50, CB Insights FinTech 250, the World Economic Forum, and American Banker. In addition, in revising Electronic Funds Transfer Act regulations as they relate to remittent, remittance transfer providers, the U.S. Consumer Financial Protection Bureau stated, quote, it believed that expanded adoption of Ripple's suite of products could allow banks and credit unions to know the exact final amount that recipients of remittance transfers will receive before they are sent, contrary to the current state of play. The XRP ledger and XRP, Ripple does not own the XRP ledger. Let's say that again. Ripple does not own the XRP ledger. The ledger's underlying code is open source. Anyone can use the XRP ledger, submit transactions to the XRP ledger, propose changes to its source code, or develop applications that run on the XRP ledger. Indeed, other users of the XRP ledger can implement changes to the XRP ledger's code without Ripple's input and even over Ripple's express objections. That has happened recently in June 2020. Over Ripple's objection, the XRP ledger's code was modified to introduce a check writing feature which allows one account to claim funds from another. Ripple's ODL product is just one application that uses the XRP ledger. Many other developers with no connection to Ripple have built software products that use the XRP ledger, such as a range of payment processing applications, including micropayments. In addition, at least before the SEC filed this lawsuit, various individuals and businesses independent of Ripple accepted XRP as a form of payment for goods and services ranging from coffee to furniture to travel. Several major charities accepted XRP for donations, including the American Red Cross, the American Cancer Society, St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, and Fidelity Charitable. The exact number of individuals and businesses that use or have used the XRP ledger or XRP is unknown and unknowable to Ripple 
but it is likely in the millions given the number of wallet addresses on the XRP ledger. XRP is also part of a robust, fully functioning currency market that allows trades between XRP and various other currencies, both traditional fiat currencies and cryptocurrencies. In 2015, FinCEN and the Department of Justice determined that XRP is a, quote, convertible virtual currency and the second largest cryptocurrency by market capitalization after Bitcoin. Before the SEC filed this lawsuit, XRP was listed on more than 200 exchanges globally. Only six of those exchanges had contracts with Ripple relating to their listing of XRP. At the time the SEC brought this lawsuit, XRP was the third largest cryptocurrency behind Bitcoin and Ether, with a total asset value of around 50 to 60 billion. From the XRP ledger's launch in 2012 to the filing of this litigation, more than 1.28 trillion XRP traded hands globally. Ripple's XRP transactions were a tiny fraction of XRP's trading volume. Throughout 2018, for example, Ripple's XRP sales never exceeded 0.5% of the global XRP trading volume. In the first quarter of 2019, Ripple's sales were only 0.32% of the overall trading volume. Since May 2020, essentially all of Ripple's sales of XRP, with full disclosure to the SEC, have been to ODL customers who have sourced XRP directly from Ripple for cross-border transactions. The SEC's filing of this lawsuit and its allegation that XRP itself is a security significantly impeded XRP markets. The price of XRP declined by approximately 70% in the days following the filing of the initial complaint, wiping out approximately 15 billion in market value and nearly every exchange accessible to US parties delisted XRP or blocked access to it. Nonetheless, the global XRP trading markets remain active with 24-hour trading volumes approaching $1 billion. So hope you guys are enjoying this. I can't answer questions today. If you have any friends that are interested in crypto, share this feed. A lot of people, the XRP army, uh, Ripple fans, you know, SEC fan, whatever. A lot of people are talking about Ripple, XRP, the XRP ledger, the SEC motion for summary judgment. When is this case going to be decided? Every, everyone's saying we got cross motions for summary judgment being filed. Uh, the case will probably be heard in the next month or two. A decision will probably come down. And what they're fighting to kind of uh, convince the judge to do is to make a decision so it doesn't go to a jury trial. Now, frankly, I, I think that's probably going to happen. Now, if the judge decides, the judge decides as a matter of law that there's no need for the case to go to a jury, which is the finder of facts. Juries are fact finders, okay? Um, my two cents is, can you imagine a jury weighing all these, these facts and evidence? Oh my goodness, this would be crazy. So um, a lot of people do expect there to be a decision, you know, hopefully sometimes this year. It's not, you know, I don't know for sure. Nobody knows for sure. There's always in law, there's always extensions and all other kinds of things, but um, we'll see, we'll see. So um, let's continue. Ripple sales, giveaways, and payments of XRP. The amended complaint alleges that from 2013 through the end of 2020, defendants engaged in one continuous offering of unregistered securities. Through that sweeping allegation, the SEC contends that every single sale, offer, or distribution of XRP by Ripple and the individual defendants was part of a single securities offering, regardless of the stark differences between Ripple's and the individual defendants' various XRP transactions. We summarize some of the many types of Ripple's XRP transactions below. Giveaways. Ripple has given away XRP for free, receiving no consideration at all. It has given away more than 2 billion XRP 
to charities and grant recipients. In its early days, Ripple also gave away more than 500 million XRP for free to early adopters, developers, and programmers. Exchange-based sales. Ripple has sold XRP on digital asset exchanges via market, pro market makers programmatically, meaning through the use of trading algorithms. Sales on digital assets exchanges are blind bid-ask transactions. Accordingly, Ripple did not and could not know who was purchasing the XRP, and the purchasers did not and could not know who was selling it. There is no contract between the buyer and the seller on an exchange. Ripple undertook no contractual obligation, obligations to exchange-based purchasers and exchange-based Purchasers received no rights in Ripple's business or right to demand anything from Ripple. The SEC alleges that Ripple sold at least 3.9 billion XRP programmatically. Wholesale sales. Ripple has sold XRP directly to certain counterparties, typically institutional buyers and ODL customers, through arm's length agreements. The SEC alleges that Ripple sold at least 4.9 billion XRP in such transactions. The contracts governing these transactions did not give the purchaser of XRP any interest in Ripple's business, imposed no obligations on Ripple to take any actions to benefit the purchasers, and did not provide the purchaser a right to demand or receive anything from Ripple beyond delivery of the purchased XRP. Form of payment. Ripple has used XRP as a currency to pay for services from certain vendors and employees who choose to accept XRP instead of or in addition to currencies, such as US dollars. Ripple's contracts to buy services included no provision obligating Ripple to take any efforts to increase the price of XRP. And like Ripple's other contracts, none of its contracts to buy services granted the counterparties any rights to share in profits earned by Ripple or to receive profits from any other source. As of December 20, 2020, Ripple had transferred roughly 25 billion XRP to various counterparties, including through XRP sales, giveaways, and purchases of services. Larson's and Garlinghouse's transactions in XRP. Christian Larson is the former CEO and current executive chairman of Ripple. He was one of the original recipients of XRP when the XRP ledger launched. After Ripple's founders gave much of their XRP to Ripple, Larson and McCaleb each retained roughly 9 billion XRP while Brito retained roughly 2 billion XRP. Larson has donated more than 2 billion XRP to charity. Larson has also sold some of his XRP, and his XRP and the proceeds from his sales have never been intermingled with Ripple's corporate accounts. None of Larson's XRP sales on exchanges involved contra contractual relationships with purchasers. Of Larson's sales on exchanges, more than 80% of the proceeds were from trades on exchanges outside of the United States. Bradley Garlinghouse was hired as Ripple's chief operating officer in April 2015 and promoted to CEO in January 2017. He had no affiliation with Ripple or the XRP ledger before April 2015. Garlinghouse never sold XRP until April 2017. He received XRP as part of his overall compensation from Ripple. As with Larson, Garlinghouse has never intermingled the proceeds from his XRP sales with Ripple's corporate accounts. None of Garlinghouse's XRP sales involved a contractual relationship with purchasers. All of Garlinghouse's sales of XRP were on exchanges, and approximately 95% of the proceeds from those sales 
were from trades on exchanges outside the United States. Okay, so they, then they go into the stand. That's basically their argument. And so I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to cut it off there. And you can see basically they're saying that there, there, there is nothing. There was no contracts with um, any XRP holders and um, that there's no law prohibiting basically what they're doing. They don't meet the, the elements that they lay out. So the rest that they're doing is just going on and on about cases, case law. It was this, it was that. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go into the legal weeds with you guys. You guys can <laughs> decide for yourself. Um, I think the court is gonna. Is the court's gonna probably make some kind of ruling on this. So you, there you have it, folks. You have your two sides of the story. I did the SEC the other day. If you want to, if you missed it, and you say, "Well, I really want to know what the SEC has to say to this," then go to my go to my YouTube channel, attorneystevevideos.com. That's attorneystevevideos.com. I have the SEC version there. Here is the Ripple version, and I believe it's on behalf of Ripple and the uh, the corporate, the executive defendants. Let's call them. So they're collectively the defendants. So both sides of the story are out there. So many people I talk to are waiting for the decision from the Securities and Exchange Commission. Will it be deemed a security? Will it not be deemed a security? Um, some people think it will lay down regulations. Other people are saying, well, it's a commodity. There's so much stuff swirling around. This is not final financial advice. Thank you, Rose, for the for the Rose. Rose, no, K, K3. Thank you, K3, for the Rose. I appreciate that. That's nice of you. Um, so we will see what happens. We will keep you posted. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. We follow this. And um, again, be very crypto out there. Uh, Strike that, motion to strike. Be very careful out there. There's a lot of weird things going on in the marketplace. We get a lot of calls from people that have lost a lot of money. This is no relationship to this case whatsoever. But just be very careful. This technology is new. I really like it. I really do think it's the future of things. I do think some things need to be sorted out. I do think there needs to be some kind of regulation. There's just too many people like losing money on things. And that's really what concerns me. Um, but anyway, I've given you both sides of the story, not financial advice, not legal advice, not any kind of advice, just attorney Steve reading, bringing you the information straight from the source. There's no, there's no middleman here. You read it, you decide and follow that. And if you like this, feel free to share the feed, feel free, fair to, uh, feel free to share my links. And, uh, we really appreciate you guys watching. We know you got a lot of things to do, a lot of choices, but appreciate you guys watching us and we'll keep you posted. All right, have a great day, everybody. Bye now.